Welcome to the Fairfax County School Board's public hearing about the fiscal year 22 budget. This is the budget that the school board is in development with um, the superintendent. Tonight's comments will come from our public who have registered to speak in advance. I'll first just go through and take a roll call of my colleagues here. Um, I will go uh, on the list that I have before me on the link, which will start with Ms. Omesh. Here. Good evening, Ms. Tolan. I'm here, thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Corbett Sanders. I'm here. Good evening. Ms. Keys Gamara. Good evening. Hi. Mr. Frisch. Good evening. Good evening. Ms. Cohen. Good evening. Hello. Ms. McLaughlin. Good evening, everybody. Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Good evening. Ms. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Hello. Um, uh, Ms. Pekarski. Hi, everyone. Ms. Darren Koufax. I see her there. Ms. Darren Koufax, are you? There you are. Hello. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Great. And I can hear you well. So, yes, well, welcome to the many members of who have registered in advance to speak tonight about the development of the fiscal year 22 school budget. This is one of the most important tasks that our school board undertakes in partnership with our superintendent. The superintendent proposed his budget to us earlier this month, and that's available online. Tonight's public hearing is solely about the development of next year's budget. So please do be sure that your comments pertain expressly to the budget. Um, if topics are not directly related to the budget, we will have to ask you to um, pause and submit your comments in writing about other matters. Um, any specific matters regarding students or discipline will not be allowed um, during this public hearing. So um, please note, we also do have students watching as they um, observe the process of how their schools work. So please, of course, keep comments respectful, even if passionate. And we look forward to hearing um, from the public this evening. So uh, members who have signed, community members who have signed up uh, should have be allowed into the online platform here. Each member will have up to three minutes and our clerk will be timing everyone. Thank you to Ms. Mulberg and Ms. Madeja for your help. Um, at the, si the sound of three minutes, speakers, please do um, wrap up and, and finish your comments because we wanna be sure everyone has time to speak. Um, you're welcome to email your comments to the board. I know some of you have already and we've received them, thank you. And um, with that, we will begin. I'll go through um, the list I have in front of me and who's available here on the Blackboard link. Um, the board will not be responding to comments. And so we will just be listening to what the public is, is saying this evening. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, speaker number one, Ms. Leah Brooks and speaker number two following on deck. I don't see active here. So Ms. Brooks, why don't you go ahead and start and I'll try and give a, a on deck in the future to whoever comes next. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Okay. Hi, my name is Leah and I'm currently a sixth grader of Hunter Twins. Today, I'm here to hopefully let you consider to add climbing equipment to the middle schools. Some examples are bar monkey bars, swings, or even a skateboard park. Why, you ask? Because it's okay to have playgrounds and swings in elementary school, but then all of a sudden when we cross over to middle school, we are considered too old to experience the joy of after three to four hours of hard work and challenge, we can't go outside, get some fresh air, and see our friends that aren't in our classes anymore. I won't be able to do fun races on the monkey bars anymore. I don't think that is very fair, and I think we need more climbing equipment at the middle schools. Thank you for your time, and Thank you very much, Ms. Brooks. And yes, indeed, we do have um, some, our first a group of speakers, our students. So uh, speaker number two, do we have you on on the uh, Ms. Ruth uh, Tawadros, is it? Tawadros? 
Okay, if you do join, we'll we'll come back to you. Uh, speaker number three, Ms. Amanda Hurst. Speaker number three, Amanda Hurst, no? Okay, well, perhaps we can- Oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get it. I'm sorry, does okay. it work now? Yes, Ms. Hurst, sorry, I didn't see you there. Yes, please Hello. go ahead, thank you, awesome. Hello. Hi, so my name is Amanda Hurst and I am a junior at John R. Lewis High School. So I'd like to preface this by saying I know very little about the school board's budget, but I do know that members budget their spending to things that benefit and are needed in our county's public schools. I understand the importance of budgeting as I am the junior class president and we are currently budgeting out our um, senior prom for next year. So I would like to urge the school board members to budget appropriately to support the proposed John R. Lewis Academy for Government and Human Rights. Myself and the team of John R. Lewis High School students have and will continue advocating for this academy. We've collected a petition with 200 signatures along letters to the school board. We've spoken with community organizations, including the new neighborhood associations, the Lewis Pyramids PTAs, and the Fairfax NAACP. I want to say thank you to Ms. Keys Gamora for being on behalf of all the students advocating uh, for this academy, for being the voice on the school board, really advocating for us um, and for this academy. We really appreciate you. We are ready to get things going and are eager to make John R. Lewis Academy a reality. But to do so, the school board must recognize the need to budget appropriately for this academy. We will continue advocating and we'll be so excited to see the school board begin discussing um, the academy come the summer. So with all that said, thank you for letting me speak and have a nice evening. Thank you, Ms. Hurst. Have a nice evening as well. Okay, speaker number four, we have Rowan Hashim. You can go ahead once you're once you're online there, Rowan. Okay. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Can you see? Hi. Okay. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Yeah. I'm Rowan Hashim, a junior at John R. Lewis High School and a class officer of my class. And speaker three, Amanda, and I are working together to ensure that a government, public policy, and human rights academy is implemented at Lewis High School. And adding on to what Amanda said, not only have we been gaining student support, but also parent and alumni support. Um, as gathered in the petition for this academy that was sent out a couple months ago. And as this public hearing uh, regard, uh, as this is a public hearing regarding the budget of our county, I'm here to make sure that the potential academy at Lewis will be one of the priorities in this budget, even though as a student, just like Amanda said, I honestly don't know much about how budgeting in our county works. Um, how, however, I do know that this academy potentially being brought to Lewis is an essential step forward in carrying on John Lewis's legacy and also on behalf of everyone that signed the petition and all the students that will one day want to attend this academy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaker five, Mr. John Callanan, uh, Kalan is that right? Callanan. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, thank you. And what an honor it is to, to speak after those students. Really, really great job. Um, so today commemorates McLean High's 11th anniversary. This is 11 plus years of being over 100% capacity Thanks to the board's decade of disregard for development in Tyson's and the Silver Line and its impact on McLean High, we're somehow facing yet another CIP absent relief to McLean. Yet while the board and superintendent have ignored McLean's ever increasing overcapacity, stopping only to add another trailer, they have provided capacity relief to schools with less of a capacity deficit. Madison was at 105% capacity, not on the reno queue, three trailers, $14 million addition. Justice, 109% capacity, not on the red OQ, zero trailers, $15 million addition. West Potomac, 119% capacity, not on the red OQ, $16.4 million addition. Cooper, 67% capacity, $46 million addition. Langley, 101% capacity, $78 million project. Wow. But enough looking backward. Looking forward, we expect a bond this fall to fund an addition at McLean. It's time. 
Looking forward, please tell us how you plan to address growth from Tyson's and the Silver Line. We need more than your vague plans to build an elementary and high school in the next decade. I'll state the obvious, more students are coming in far greater numbers than you project. Although I applaud the board's placement of a modular at McLean, we know that this is not enough. Looking forward, when will the board finally connect with the Board of Supervisors to receive development data and to prioritize proper money to our school? Although you finally started a dialogue with the supervisors, you have to move faster. This should have been done a decade ago. It's incredible that the two boards and the two CIPs are still not connected. In case you haven't realized it, you're all part of the same government. Please connect. In the absence of an FCPS plan for how to deal with Tyson's development and Silver Line development, I'll offer a starting point. First, please put a bond on the ballot this fall to fund an addition at McLean. Second, implement a formal method to receive development data from the Board of Supervisors. Third, please use this data to develop a comprehensive plan to address the anticipated significant increase in student population in this area. It's time to get to work on this. Your attention is long overdue. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eileen Chalot. My name is Eileen Chalet. My daughter Caroline is a special ed second grader at Providence Elementary. I wanna thank the school board for acknowledging your ethical responsibility to make up for a year of disrupted learning for all students and to encourage you to continue to budget for that. However, I'm here specifically to ask you to also acknowledge your legal responsibility to provide compensatory services for your most vulnerable special education students and a budget specifically for compensatory services. Now, the special ed community has really good reason to believe that Superintendent Braybrand is not planning or budgeting for our kids' needs. Dr. Anderson, on July 21st, you directed the superintendent to provide a plan for students with whose disabilities prevent them from accessing virtual learning, saying you would not support all virtual without that plan. And yet when three separate school board members asked for that plan on August 18th, the superintendent replied that he was far too busy to care about the needs of kids with disabilities, and maybe he'd get around to it next month. Thus was born the federal civil rights investigation against Superintendent Bray Brand for denying kids like my daughter equal access to an education. Now, the result of the superintendent's openly insubordinate refusal to budget or plan for special education has been as predictable as it has been tragic. Of $74.7 million in federal COVID relief funds, FCPS has spent $0 on special ed to date with a total planned spend of only $27 per special ed student. Now, if Congress intended special ed to merely get side benefits from spending on all students, they wouldn't have mentioned special ed five times in their list of 12 allowable uses for these funds. Now, you had so many options, even if you couldn't support return to school in person. Put these kids in private school, Prince William County, place them there. Um, you can send aides to their houses. You can reimburse for a private related services, assistive technology. Instead, FCPS directed our sainted special education teachers to do the impossible with no resources whatsoever and then blamed these amazing teachers when students like my daughter still couldn't access virtual learning. Now, Ms. McLaughlin, I am begging you individually, acknowledge out loud tonight that FCPS has not been providing an appropriate education for kids with disabilities during virtual learning. Ms. Ms. Chile, superintendent I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, but your comments need to be specific about the development of the budget that's forthcoming, please. Yes, direct the superintendent Tendant to budget for compensatory services, not learning loss, not extended learning opportunities, recover, not recovery services, compensatory services. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, just a reminder to our speakers, uh, please do try to be as specific as possible about current budget and what you're seeking. Uh, we have speaker number seven, Ms. Lisa Turkle-Tab. Turkle-Tab. Yep, you got it. Thank you. Um, 
Holly, I'm here to discuss with you the fiscal budget for 21-2022 school year. First, it appears that the 2021 budget assumes five days of in-person learning will be offered, but there has not been any significant board work that, to, that strategically tackles the question, how can we offer five days of learning? If you put this question into a strategic risk assessment framework, you will see solutions you have not yet considered, assuming the FEA is not leading the discussion. If you would turn your time, attention, and set aside the right amount of budget dollars to address and answer the question, how do we get these kids in school for five days of in-person learning in the fall in an environment where the kids will most likely not be vaccinated and community spread will not be zero, you might be surprised at the solutions that will come. You can only solve problems that you set out to solve and set aside money to solve. If you do not set out to solve the five-day in-person problem, it will never be solved. Next, all current indications show that virtual learning will exist in some format for the next year. However, there is very little oversight discussion or resources on how to approve this format, including the right amount of budgetary dollars set aside. For starters, in one of the presentations, Dr. Brabrand specifically called out a math program called ST Math as an application to be used next year. At the elementary level, ST Math is one of the main failures in virtual education. ST Math is remedial busy work. My second grader had to count to 25 more than 10 times before advancing to more challenging work. After the first two weeks in this application, myself and many other parents told our teachers our children would no longer participate in this. This application is horrible. There are free services like Hunan, which is a better math program. The teachers know this app is horrible. The parents know this app is horrible. The students know this app is horrible, but the administration has no idea because of complete lack of feedback and oversight into what is happening in virtual education. The budget should include an option for virtual education outsourcing. If you are forcing us into a virtual education environment, why shouldn't it be the best virtual education environment that is out there? Why are we not outsourcing this program to something like an effective commercial product like K through 12 education? Our teachers are not experts in virtual education and have not received proper training. Commercial product instructors have. Just today, a parent wrote, my daughter in sixth grade came out of the virtual meeting in tears because her teacher started crying during the lesson because kids were not giving the teacher attention. This is not school. This is not learning. Virtual education is not education. It is busy work. Hey, thank you very much. We have speaker number eight, uh, Perry and Brian Henderson. If you are on, do we have Perry and Brian Henderson? Okay, uh, Nellie Rhodes, speaker number nine, Nellie Rhodes, don't believe is with us. Okay, number 10, Alex Levine, I see Alex. Hi, can you see me? Um, not just yet, but we can hear you. Oh, okay, sorry, oh, here we go. Um, See. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank you for your time. I wanted to reiterate some of the things that some of the earlier speakers had said. Uh, Ms. Chalet had said that we need to plan a budget for compensatory services. Um, and that we, it was really shocking to me what she had said that we've spent zero dollars of the 72 million that have been allocated for special ed funds. Um, you know, that seems amazing to me and, and incredible. It's, and that kind of brings me into a point which is that we need an accounting of where these CARES Act money has come from and how it's been spent. Uh, I spent a couple of hours looking on the internet today and it's not listed anywhere. Um, as far as we know, a very, very small portion of the CARES Act money has been spent. That's money that we need to better be able to understand where it's been spent, how, how it's been spent. It's money that was uh, actually, if you go to the VDOE memo on how it should be spent, it talks about um, the emergency needs of students during the pandemic, including, and here I'm quoting from the guidance memo, the unique needs of low-income children, of students, children with disabilities, English learners, racial and ethnic minorities, 
students experiencing homelessness and foster care youth. So right within that description is students with disabilities and sort of the fact that zero dollars of that have been spent on anything other than virtual learning for those students uh, is shocking to me and it's something that we need to address in the budget. And the second point I want to talk about is that the budget is based on enrollment numbers of 189,944 students. Um, that's obviously not correct. There's 176,000 some odd students. Uh, so to me, why would you base your budget on a lie? Uh, you, you, I mean, I know we're getting funded for 189,000 students, but we should be basing the budget on the actual number of students. And the reason being, be because we should be spending the money efficiently. We shouldn't be spending it in order to address 189,000 students' needs. We should be trying to give a quality education to the 176,000 that are left. And, and I think, you know, if you look at the budget documents, they talk about this is our anticipated enrollment. I think actually the anticipated enrollment is going to be far lower than 176,000 next, uh, next fall if, if we're not able to provide families uh, with any kind of guarantee as to whether or not school will be full time in the fall. So that's another important budget consideration is in order to stamp the enrollment numbers in order to prevent them from going even further down, we need to really give some sort of guarantee now because what we're seeing is families fleeing and uh, you know they're fleeing in droves to be quite honest. So I know the governor's current budget doesn't penalize that, but eventually down the road, the budget is going to penalize FCPS for losing all of these families. So that's something, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I do just want to um, make a housekeeping announcement here that speakers, once you have had your turn um, and you've been active in the in the Blackboard link, we moving you from active speaking status and you can please continue to view the public budget hearing on our website where it's being live streamed and a recording of this I believe will also be available. So thank you to our clerk for um, continuing with that, that process to keep our speaker list easy to manage as we go through here. Thank you very much. Okay, we have speaker number 11, Mr. Arthur Purves. Madam Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Madam Chairman, members of the board, and Mr. Superintendent. My name is Arthur Purvis. I address you as president of the Fairfax County Taxpayers Alliance. We have three observations. First, on September 3rd last year, we emailed the Office of Communications to ask how many employees had gotten full pay while not working during the COVID lockdown and the cost. On September 11, we received a reply that the answer would cost us $87. On September 22, without our agreeing to the cost, we received another reply stating that our questions do not fall within the scope of FOIA, along with some woefully incomplete data. Another email on September 29 said we still owed the $87. Besides being asked to pay for an answer we did not get, we were surprised that the school board did not already have the answer. Therefore, we have to estimate the answer. Given that salaries cost 1.7 billion, a conservative estimate that a quarter of that was spent on non-working employees would result in a cost of 400 million or 20% of the school transfer. We also note that the budget asks for a $44 million increase from the county, even though current enrollment has decreased by 9,000. Second, this would not be an issue if schools were open. Fairfax County reports COVID deaths by age group. As of today, 82% of the county's 776 deaths out of a population of 1.1 million has been among ages 65 or older. For ages 50 to 64, mortality is five hundredths of a percent. For ages 18 to 49, it is six thousandths of a percent. And there have been no deaths for ages 17 and under. The county does not publish ICU availability, but statewide ICU utilization is 57%. Hospitals are not overcrowded. What is not reported are the hardships imposed, especially on low-income families, by the lockdown. It's fair to assume that those hardships overwhelm the COVID risks for those under 65. Please open schools. 
Third, we've been saying for a quarter of a century, it is within the power of the school board to dramatically reduce racial inequality by bringing back phonics-based reading instruction and arithmetic drill. One Fairfax is a stunning admission that the school curricula, especially in early elementary school, has failed to give equal opportunity to low-income blacks and Hispanics. Whole word instruction has a century-long record of failure while you haven't even tried phonics-based reading instruction. Before the Civil War, it was illegal to teach a black to read for fear that the ability to read would enable them to become independent. To present words to children and expect them to memorize words without being able to sound them out is not teaching reading. The cost of not teaching reading is enormous, not only in terms of budgets for remediation, welfare, and law enforcement, but in the human cost of ruined lives. You can fix this. We oppose taxation without education. Please open schools and really teach reading. Thank you. Thank you. We have speaker number 12, Ms. Kimberly Adams. Good evening, Chair Anderson, Budget Chair, uh, pardon me, <laughs> school board members, Dr. Braybarn and leadership team. My name is Kimberly Adams. I am the president of the Fairfax Education Association. It does seem that according to social media reports, I am the most powerful person in FCPS right now. So tonight I intend to use that power for the good of all employees in FCPS. After months of struggle to reinvent teaching online and the nearly full year of finding our way through a pandemic alongside our fellow man, your employees are in need of more than just a pat on the head or an expectation of hope. We need you to compensate us as we expect along a salary scale as we expect to follow a salary scale that was put in place to get your employees on a path to being made whole after decades of underfunding. Previous school board members sought to increase our student success by improving our caring culture, raising a premier workforce through their resource stewardship. We are asking you, this current board, that in this budget, you prioritize our workforce through the step increases as expressed on our salary scales as promised. Do not hold back on this effort. Your employees are in need of true acknowledgement that what they are doing matters for our school system. Buying them a cloth mask and expecting more dedication is not feasible at this time. Proving that you are listening to your workforce is. Pay them what has been promised for years past. The FEA is committed to working with state lawmakers to increase the dollars at our level. We are always there to advocate for the Board of Supervisors to provide funding. But you know that your proposed budget will set the stage for all of that advocacy. If you start with a level budget and do not show the desire to compensate your employees, then those higher up will not see a need to address this as a priority. Show your employees that you value them, that you do expect great work, and in turn you will pay for what we are worth. Right now we are worth more. We cannot hope for more dollars in our checks. Hope is not a strategy for tangible things. We must take action and we need this board to take action. Stand with your employees. Finally, we ask for your help with our salaries to maintaining our safe return to school buildings. Schools are open. Paying us is part of this equation. If our families are cared for and able to be fed and clothed to keep a roof and Wi-Fi operating in our lives, you will have a staff that is ready to support students. Hope is not a strategy in any of this important work. Thank you for your support of this budget. Thank you. We have speaker number 13, Jeanette Corselius. Hope I got that right. Hi there. Good evening, Superintendent Dr. Brabant and school board members. My name is Jeanette Zahia Corselius and I'm on the board of directors of the Fairfax Education Association. And I am a general music teacher, choir director, and calm instructor for the county. I am six months away from turning 30 in my, my sixth year of teaching and still living at home at my parents' house. Many of my colleagues are FCPS alum who chose to give back to their community but cannot afford to live within their community. Some of them live at home, or they travel as far as Stafford County to work here. I have a bachelor's degree and I'm a professional. I shape and mold young minds and prepare them to go forth and follow their dreams. 
but I don't make a living wage. Every summer I work up to three jobs, usually at summer camps, and I teach privately. I teach clarinet lessons. And in the past, I've worked at grocery stores part-time while working full-time. My story isn't unique, nor is it new, but it is unacceptable. We have colleagues who cannot afford to live in the county, and as I've stated before, and while my salary is not adequate, there is a huge income disparity between our teachers and our education support professionals. Our hourly staff, such as bus drivers, food service workers, custodians, and office staff are educators too. With their salaries, they qualify for low-income housing in Fairfax County. This should not surprise anyone as the median household income in Fairfax County is $124,000 and compared to $78,000 being the median income across the United States. They deserve respect, protection, and honor in the form of a livable wage. While I want to thank Dr. Braban for keeping the Fairfax family intact, I urge you to raise our salaries at the, by at least 5% all across the board, plus our lost step increase from last year. The perpetuated myth that our state is in a deficit must stop now. When we lowball workers in a woman-denominated de profession, we show that our students and community that sexism and misogyny are acceptable. When our lowest paid workers are predominantly people of color, specifically black and brown men and women, it shows that our students, to our students and community that racism and classism are acceptable and their jobs aren't respectable. How can we claim that we are looking at everything through an equity lens? How can we recruit educators of color who want to build generational wealth without a living income? FCPS is one of the largest employing bodies in Virginia. Whatever decisions are made here set a precedent. While 40 measures currently hurt our staff, children, and community, fight austerity, fund education, and pay us what we're worth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaker number 14, Ms. Carla Okuchi. Good evening, Chair Anderson, school board members, and Superintendent Braybrand. I'm Carla Obucci, the Vice President of the Fairfax Education Association, speaking on behalf of our members. We invest in what we value. Thank you, Dr. Braybrand and the school board for making strides to fully fund our budget for the past two years. However, we missed the mark in making salary step increases and cost of living a priority. We look at our neighbor, Prince William County, whose school board made investing in their employees a budget priority without missing a beat, even during a global pandemic. Then there's Loudoun County, taking great pride in offering the most competitive salary scales in Northern Virginia. I do remember a time when that was Fairfax County. It is the work of our dedicated employees who make sure that we continue to deliver a world-class education to our students. Shouldn't our salaries reflect that too? During this unprecedented time where all employees have gone above and beyond to prepare and deliver meals, recreate lessons for engaging online instruction, fixing technology issues, configuring and distributing devices, drafting and redrafting new schedules and safety plans, checking in on our students and families, all while juggling the shared trauma of this pandemic on them and our own families. As a result of these exemplary role models our staff is providing to our community, we need this school board to make the case to the Board of Supervisors to provide the appropriate funding. Align education professional salaries commensurate with the level of critical needs support and care being provided. A living wage for our education support professionals and prioritizing the salary steps and COLA within this budget is critical. If our goal is to diversify our workforce, bring income equity to this profession, and address the national educator shortage, then you must make salaries a budget priority. We applaud the continued investment in our students' instructional and in particular their social emotional well-being in as we need more counselors and registered nurses in each of our buildings. Our situation shed light on the budgetary needs to update cybersecurity protections, web conferencing, digital instructional tools, laptops for all staff, including IA students and substitutes. Thank you for making sure to include wireless microphones and amplification equipment to protect our workers from permanent vocal damage and fatigue while delivering instruction behind a mask to a classroom filled with students or those in the safety of their homes. The Fairfax Education Association stands ready to help advocate to the Board of Supervisors not only to support this budget, but to include the additional dollars needed to meet the needs of our students, 
employees and our school system that our community takes great pride in. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 15, Bill Peabody. Yeah, thank you to the uh, board and others. My name is Bill Peabody from the Braddock District. Since 2000, school spending has increased five times the rate of enrollment and almost three times the rate of inflation. Test sc scores have fallen since 2009. This is pre-COVID data. Politicians of all stripes will be obscuring results with the COVID card, but these trends have been with Fairfax County for a while. Spending up, pay up, test down. The school budget shows hiring of 226 more employees in a time when enrollment has dropped by 9,000 students. You want to spend a half a million dollars on three negotiators. Who do they represent? Hire a truly independent auditor instead. FDR warned the nation about government unions as they negotiate from the same side of the table. Both parties work for the same government. Parents are homeschooling or sending kids to private schools. Why not use this opportunity to offer a tax credit? Each student has an average cost of over $15,000. Surely a credit of 500 would leave a substantial windfall for county taxpayers. You could use income qualifiers and limit the credit to two children per household. I understand there is a small portion of state funding involved with our budget, but it's minuscule compared to the amount the county taxpayers pay. For almost a year, you've offered taxation without education and parents are financially exhausted. The county can no longer simply raise taxes at a multiple of the inflation rate. People of means are moving away. IRS data shows the county has lost over 12 billion in wealth over the last two decades. And that number is increasing exponentially. <clears throat> 2020 moving statistics show Virginia a net loser with a rank of 37 for inward migration. Most of this is from Northern Virginia. If your schools and programs are so great, why do they leave? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaker 16, is that person here? Is it Sana Busit? Person on our um, active list. Uh, Sana Busit, perhaps you'll join a bit. We have a speaker number 17 then, Ms. Tina Williams. Good evening, I'm Tina Williams, president of Fairfax County Federation of Teachers, which represents thousands of educators in Fairfax County. Even before this pandemic, FCPS struggled to provide equitable education for all children, especially those with special needs, physical or intellectual disabilities, students speaking English as a second language, and those from disadvantaged communities. To help students and staff recover from the pandemic and achieve caring culture goal, we urge you to prioritize the following in the budget. COVID-19 relief support. All schools must have the resources necessary to reopen school buildings safely. This means FCPS will implement our 11 pillars of a safe reopening and ensure all students and staff have adequate PPE, cleaning supplies, and ven ventilation systems. Our members are disappointed with the delay of vaccinations and look forward to being vaccinated as quickly as possible once there are more dosages available. School districts across the country are implementing surveillance testing programs, and we'd like to see FCPS allocate resources in the budget for surveillance testing to keep students and staff safe. Next, keep all staff whole and compensate them fairly. This budget keeps the FCPS family intact and completes the final year of the CIS salary scale enhancement. However, all staff deserve their expected step in MSA increases. We urge FCPS to match the governor's proposed salary increase for school employees by utilizing federal funds and other resources. Increase social, emotional, and mental health support. Our kids are experiencing anxiety, stress, and trauma. The proposed budget funds recurring school counselors, psychologists, and school nurse positions. We urge you to fund as many new positions as possible to meet the recommended minimum staffing ratios. Increase support for the most vulnerable student population. 
The budget hires additional ESOL teachers. We urge you to fund more school-based ESOL and special education positions to help directly support students. Due to COVID, there are students that are not getting age out services before they age out. Extended, extending the eligibility for this program and recovery services by at least a year will help them receive these needed services. We also urge FCPS to take steps to expand our community schools model, which offers direct services and support to students and families. Finally, continue to eliminate the digital divide for students and employees. The budget funds recurring T-SPEC and SPIC positions, but schools really need more of these critical positions to meet the needs of students and staff. We urge you to adopt a budget that invests in these your employees, students, and communities. We need a budget that will help now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaker 18, Judith Harbeck. Hello? There I am. Okay. Yes, hello. We can hear, we can hear ah, you. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, good evening. I'm Judy Harbeck, chair of the Education Committee of the Mount Vernon Council of Citizens Associations, which has a long history of strong and vocal support for the needs of FCPS. This year, we understand that virtual learning was necessary, but deficits have resulted and will need to be addressed in a timely and robust manner to head off permanent damage, as we discussed in our recently provided resolution. But thus, we were shocked that, that the superintendent's proposed budget's only reference to a need for significant remediation is an entry under unfunded needs. The superintendent rightly references the Commonwealth requirement to state the needs of the school system. The requirement does not say state the needs as constricted by preemptive assumptions regarding the county's willingness or ability to pay. As longtime advocates, we are not strangers to the political give and take of the annual budget process, but we believe it is critical at this juncture to state and cost out all the needs for the better understanding of the public and the BOS. We all hope that additional outside funds will address the crucial remediation issue. However, the public deserves a clear picture of the resources needed so that if the hope does not materialize in a timely fashion or is inadequate, informed decisions can be made. The proposed budget also rejects any teacher compensation in increases, even as an unfunded need, and for the second consecutive year. It has long been recognized that FCPS teacher salary scales placed our schools at a competitive disadvantage. Many of our competitors did not completely freeze salaries last year. Some have announced new increases this year. By contrast, many of our teachers will actually have smaller paychecks than in fiscal year 2020 due to rising benefit costs. In short, FCPS will fall even further behind and we will fail our teachers in keeping their wages competitive. Fair compensation is a need for any entity wanting to attract and retain quality staff. Before a demonstrated need is labeled unaffordable, careful consideration needs to be paid whether we can afford the consequences. Failing to include a pay increase even as an unfunded need, is also a slap in the face to teachers and staff. It disrespects and demeans their often Herculean efforts to do the best they can in circumstances which no one wanted and for which no one was fully prepared. We asked that the school board in adopting its advertised budget include funding for a robust remediation or recovery services program. The likely resources needed should be clearly stated to show the magnitude of the issue, not respecting whether additional funds will be received from outside sources. And, to, and we, secondly, to include funding for a compensation increase for teachers and school administration staff, or at least include them in the unfunded needs list with specification of resources needed to avoid falling further behind. As Helmos, Without the clear statement of the real needs of APS, we are all limited in our advocacy and our ability to weigh the proper balance of taxes and services. In these uncertain times, one thing, though, is still sure. You may not get what you ask for, but you certainly won't get it if you don't ask for it. Please ask. Thank you. Thank you. Your speaker number 19, Mr. Norm Hall. 
Good evening, Ms. Marin, members of the school board, Dr. Braybrand. I'm here as a director on the executive board of the Fairfax County chapter of the Service Employees International Union. Our members work in FCPS as daycare teachers, supervisors, and school health aides. These are tough times. For many of us, the normal before the pandemic wasn't really working for us, even as we provided exceptional value for county residents. Many of us are now off the payrolls, struggling economically due to employer dictated conditions. I call for FCPS to work with the county to make sure we get two budgets in sync, developed to support a new normal that employs our workers with everything needed to support greatly expanded childcare and clinic care. Not business as usual, but a cooperative approach with frontline staff wisdom and input. 90 SAC centers are still closed, as are slots for health aides. We assume that all of the jobs we filled before school closed last March will still need to be filled. I assume, based on the lack of news given to us, that program administrators will want a system reset with no review of what might be built better. Yes, SAC staff and health aides are county employees, but decisions made by the school system affect our jobs. Please recall, I have repeatedly advocated to keep hourly staff from both FCPS and the county pull through consideration of pandemic leave and job matching, along with unemployment options that all school-based personnel need. I thought we had consensus that all personnel in schools are critical to the mission of the school system in one Fairfax. Critically, SAC staff and health aides have an average tenure that exceeds those of your special education teachers. To lose us through attrition means less experience in supporting children when they may need it most. Days ago, President Biden's executive order on return to school expressed a commitment from the federal government to have data collection and union participation along with those others who have been struggling with the challenges of the pandemic. FCPS has taken a lot of criticism about return to school, but FCPS has been transparent. Where has there been public discussion about the jobs to be done by the people doing childcare and healthcare inside these schools? Next summer, will we have SummerSAC, Camp Fairfax, SRS, some other model that might support much larger numbers of staffing? Maybe some permutation. Please put this on the agenda of the February 3rd skip meeting and follow up. Reflecting on one Fairfax, how long do we ignore the reality that our county's child care workforce is predominantly people of color and female who get less attention than other workers with comparable experience and skills? And that our health aides compare favorably with instructional assistants in that their expertise and experience greatly exceed the minimum job requirements? The common thread is that professionals are discounted by a system that doesn't really see my union sisters and brothers for who they are, hidden, out of sight, out of mind, at a time when they are as much needed as the protections needed to work safely in schools. Thank you for considering your hidden workforce and ensuring that the next school and county budgets are based on what we all have to offer. Thank you, Mr. Hall. William Horkin. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Bill Horkin. I have been teaching at Justice High School for 23 years. This last week I started teaching under my fifth president, one of whom I met at the school, another one of whom one of my teachers was an intern for at the White House. The distance I have traveled to and from the school over these 23 years is greater than the distance from the earth to the moon. I've been in the hospital three times over the last 10 years, for once for four days. I've taught each time the day after I got out. I'm saying this not so you can say we appreciate you, because according to the superintendent's budget, you don't. That budget treats teachers like chattel. I'm saying this not so you can say thank you, because that's just a slap in the face. I say this to show that I'm not in this profession for the money or praise or fame, but it doesn't mean I can't be insulted, which is what you're doing if you're not offering teachers a pay raise this year. Some say there's no money in the budget for that. That is not true. Some say this is because of COVID. That is not true either. The majority of funds the school system gets are from property taxes. Property values in Fairfax County are up 7% from November 2019 to November 2020. So there's actually more revenue there. This by itself should add over $100 million to the funds. Most of the rest of the funds come from the state. And the governor promised he didn't cut any funds from education this year. Did he lie? I don't think so. Also, the state was willing to give Fairfax County $32 million to go towards teacher raises if only the county would match the funds. 
and like most other counties, Fairfax chose not to do this. Every financial planner in the world will tell you, do you ever have a chance to take advantage of matching funds? You scrimp, you save, you do whatever it is to do that. It's 100% return on investment. Unfortunately, again, Fairfax County didn't do this. It's not surprising because often they ask teachers to do things that the county is not willing to do for the teachers. Finally, I have a suggestion for Dr. Braband. Out of respect for and show of solidarity with teachers, he should forego any pay raise he is scheduled for to get this year. It's interesting that only takes only about 15 seconds to find teacher's pay skill for Fairfax County online, but it's nearly impossible to find the superintendent's contract. So again, in closing, I have a lot more to say, but only three minutes to say it. So please don't say we appreciate your service because without giving teachers a pay raise, that's just a slap in the face to me and to other teachers. So thank you for your time, that's all. Thank you very much for speaking this evening. Our next speaker is speaker 21, Ms. Jenna White. Thank you. I don't think I'll be able to get my video to work. I've heard it said many times oh, during you. the that we're all. Ms. White, we can't see you, just so you know. Okay. Um, I've heard it said many times during COVID that we are all experiencing trauma. I agree we have all experienced a tremendously difficult time and a potentially unbearable level of stress. This stress, when it's not mitigated or buffered by protective relationships, is known as toxic stress. The good news is that just like with our COVID mitigation factors, high levels of prolonged stress can also be mitigated through intentional and collective action. This work is what is known as trauma-informed schools. Despite the challenges of COVID, we are fortunate in that the science of adversity and resilience has been around for decades, with volumes of research, studies, and data available. This information cries out for us to use as we meet the tsunami of need that will walk into the school building as we return to school. That includes not only students, but staff and families as well. Tonight, I want to focus on one ask that's essential to confront the COVID crisis of COVID. We can mitigate the social, emotional, and academic impact, but just by putting further burden on the shoulders of school mental health uh, based staff or just putting a label of SEL on our response is not enough. We must go beyond labels and buzzwords and invest strategically to create a new FCPS culture. To do this in a meaningful, collaborative, and foundational way across the county, we need to create the position of a trauma-informed school specialist. We have outstanding professional development around trauma-informed schools and amazing school-based mental health teams. But to fully utilize the science, principles, and practices of trauma-informed schools, we need to work collaboratively across disciplines in Fairfax County Public Schools to make this trauma-informed work truly transformative for our students, staff, and families. A trauma-informed specialist, a position several other school departments across the state currently utilize, would be FCPS's leader in embedding the trauma-informed lens in our school culture, our strategic plan, and our day-to-day -day operations. This position could ensure our trauma-informed efforts are not siloed, but dovetail with instruction, staff recruitment and retention, discipline reform, and our equity focus. This position will work hand in hand, in hand with school principals to move beyond the risk of one and done professional development. I recognize the challenging budget climate. This is an investment that will above all support academic instruction. To cite one study, it has been well established that the addition of trauma sensitive resources into schools means that students with trauma histories will be better equipped to reach educational attainment goals. A meta-analysis by Durlock et al. in 2010 found student performance increased an average of 11 to 17 points based on standardized tests. Students suffering from the neurological impacts of trauma are not available to learn, both broadly and on the day-to-day -day level. This is the time to transform our overall school culture and climate. Please prioritize innovation and results by creating a trauma-informed school specialist position. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. Speaker number 22, Nadine Wright. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Good evening, superintendent, school board members, and leadership team. I am Nadine Wright, and I have been teaching in Fairfax County since 1997. Governor Northam has stated that he recognizes the incredible work public school employees have done this past year and is recommending that the state passes a budget that gives all school employees a 2% raise with the possibility of a larger increase. It is disappointing that FCPS is not working to match these funds 
to recognize the hard work employees have done this year. It is important that FCPS work to reallocate federal funding and other resources to give employees, ex um, excuse me, employees expected step and market scale adjustment increases. I have been teaching for over 25 years. This school year by far has been the hardest I have experienced, working six to seven days a week, 10 plus hours a day, just to meet the demands placed upon me. By not getting a step increase now affects me and my colleagues, not just now, but also in our retirement. I now see that my health insurance pay has gone up. So essentially, I am now making less money this year than I did last year. Now, how is that showing myself and other educators we are valued? Please use money from the CARES Act to fund your teacher's pay increase and really have the caring culture and premier workforce that you brag about. If you care and you feel we matter, then show us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wright. We have speaker 23, Allison Baldassari. Baldassari? Baldassari, thank you. Hi, Go good evening. As an advocate for students with special needs, I first urge you to budget what is necessary for a successful division-wide ban on seclusion for August 2022. This includes immediately contracting with those outside gurus who have successfully eliminated seclusion in other schools and settings with problems worse than ours. These gurus created cultural shifts inside these schools and settings. They initiate different ways of working with students to minimize the likelihood of them feeling unsupported and unable to adapt to their current situation. FCPS's Office of Special Education Instruction stated a desire to try Dr. Ross Green's collaborative and proactive solution, CPS, and Grafton's Ukuru system, both evidence-based methods used successfully in schools and settings all over the country and internationally to eliminate seclusion and prevent restraint. Note that Grafton took five years to eliminate seclusion. Of course, they had to create their program as they went, where CPS can contract its use now. Dr. Green expects a school-wide adoption of CPS to take multiple years for success. Therefore, a ban in just a year and a half is ambitious, especially if not embarked on right away. Dr. Green's books outline how training teachers in CPS is only the start of successfully adopting his collaborative, humane approach. Teachers must hone new skills and radically new ways of viewing students. They should participate in collaborative groups and mentoring to improve their practice. It will take all the time we have, even if we start now for a full embrace of new systems. The next budgetary allocation I'd like to advocate for is a twice exceptional or two-way specialist. A TUI specialist was recommended in the equity and AAP study. I believe a TUI specialist could help the numerous high school and middle school students across the division who've been denied FAPE and access owed under Section 504, including access to electives, not giving up free choice electives for SPED electives, access to foreign language advanced AP and IB courses, access to extracurriculars and inclusive social events. A specialist in trauma-informed practices is another position I'd like to see in something other districts have invested in. Additionally, I'd like to see FCPS budget um, for more related service providers, especially speech language pathologists, SLPs. POAC and SEPTA have been requesting this for years. Many feel the scarcity of SLPs have prevented preschool autism students from getting speech services. Yes, PAC students denied speech services. Parents are asked to wait and see how their preschooler does in a language rich environment. My final point of advocacy, I'm wondering if funding and staffing for ATS was a limitation in getting special needs students ready for distance learning. Many of them could have equitably accessed distance learning with simple, relatively inexpensive equipment such as touchscreen, special mouse, or keyboard. Many special education students already qualify for ATS services. So why can't ATS consult on their needs for distance learning? I've seen too many students whose difficulty with moving or clicking the mouse requires a parent to be tethered to them throughout their distance learning. Let's address this with whatever funding is necessary so special ed students aren't again so shortchanged during our next national emergency. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have speaker number 24, Mr. James Ear. Hey, uh, thank you. Good evening, Dr. Anderson, school board members, and Dr. Brabant. I'm the father of a recent high school graduate, a ninth grader, and uncle to three other Fairfax students. And within my family, two students are coping with virtual learning and two are failing. Uh, until last year, I kind of took for granted the education here in Fairfax County. Now I'm more active in the community. I follow these school board meetings 
And I'm here tonight because I'm concerned at the cost and resources for educating our children. I see they're going down for the first time in eight years, when I would expect they would be sharply rising after one and a half years of less than optimal virtual education. So I'd like to cover three points tonight. First, the strategic plan really doesn't address the negative educational impact of the pandemic. Second, the budget is not aligned to remediate students that have been disconnected for a year. And third, and I think most importantly, the board has a great opportunity to focus the budget on the problem that I'm hearing from the mothers and fathers, and they've been pleading for your assistance. You know, I think in any normal year, I would give the strategic plan and budget high marks, but after reading 217 pages, I really couldn't find a reference to the negative impact of virtual learning. Within the student success strategic plan I see on page 20, it lists early education, elimination of gaps, and the portrait of a graduate, all great things as desired strategic outcomes. You know, I would recommend the board really think about adding another desired outcome, make up education, or maybe it's non-traditional remediation, I don't know. Um, this year's strategic plan should focus on repairing the damage caused by the pandemic and virtual education. You know, I think the November FCPS study of teaching and learning during the pandemic noted that the most damage has been to our middle school students with a 167% increase of Ds and Fs, a 350% increase in Fs in two or more classes. And to me, it seems the gap is widening between our successful students and those performing unsatisfactory. It is in my family. Uh, I found it interesting that last May during these, the 21 budget review, only three COVID questions were asked among 87, and none of those questions involved educational impact. I think it would be helpful to see answers to questions like, what can we do to address the damage of non-standard teaching? What, can we, what would it cost to provide tutoring for one year to those failing as a result of virtual learning? And maybe, can we delay some programs like school bus recapitalization, turf field replacement, and non-critical maintenance one time to fund a more focused student success initiative? So my last point's about hope. My hope is the board will rise to this leadership challenge, address head on the damage that the parents have been describing to you the past year. Please consider revising the strategic plan and the budget to include a student success outcome that directly addresses the lost learning and failing students. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have speaker 25, Mr. Dave Swan. Madam Chairman, by name and by need, a powerful tool. I am Dave Swan, Chairman of the Support Services Employees Advisory Council. Mr. Mr. Swan, can you speak up just a bit, please? We wanna be sure to hear you clearly. Yes, can you hear me now? That's much better, thank you. You'd like okay. to restart. I am Dave Swan, Chairman of the Support Services Employees Advisory Council, representing the needs of your most diverse workforce. We are your essential frontline workers, tradesmen, IT and finance professionals, your HR and security leaders, your custodians and central office workers, your food service workers and parent liaisons. We are your transportation and warehouse workers, your instructional assistants and more. We represent over 40% of your workers at no cost to them and we have needs. It has been said that a budget is a financial commitment to your priorities. Show me your budget, you show me your priorities. Our health care costs have risen 5% again this year. Our position vacancies are nearing all time highs. 50% of our tradesmen can retire in the next five years, yet we have an expanded Trades for Tomorrow program. 14% of all support members of the FCRS program can fully retire tomorrow and another 14% could take early retirement. Our need for bus drivers exceeds both the teacher vacancies and the national driver shortage. We need to double the number of field custodians just to meet 80% of their daily vacancies. 60% of the equipment that our users, workers use is past its life cycle. The REOC funds assigned are less than 40% of the need. We must adopt the final $3 million just to get our instructional assistance to one half the pay of teachers. We're adding four more unpaid holidays to next year's calendar that cuts the earning potential of our most vulnerable hourly workers. Last Thursday, leadership concluded that FCPS won't have a caring culture unless it makes progress in teachers feeling respected at work. They concluded this from the teacher only survey as no money was allocated to survey your support professionals. 
the 60% of the teachers that felt respected is actually higher than the percentage of support staff from the survey the year before. The SSEAC is concerned that without funding priority, your support employees will remain out of sight, out of mind. We received no step or COLA last year from while some surrounding counties did. No step or COLA is again proposed while Loudoun County includes a three and a half percent raise. The state offers a 2% bonus if matched. Some will do this while we say there are no funds. Hiring and keeping a premier workforce in a caring culture requires strong prioritization and focus to meet the needs of the named. We ask that you look harder at this budget to capture the goals that we say that we hold dear. Let's find the money to ensure our goals of equity in all that we do and maintaining a premier workforce are met in this budget. Our name is the Support Services Employees Advisory Council, and I thank you for your dedication and service in helping to meet our needs. Thank you, Mr. Swan. Speaker 26, Ms. Liz Murphy. I'm here to remind the school board that their no vote at the December 1st, 2020 forum meeting calling for the development of an academy for leadership, government, public policy, and human rights at Lewis High School once again closed the door for opportunity on Lewis High School students. During the December meeting, Ms. Karen Keyes Gamara outlined the program development work she had done and listed the national and local support she had assembled. Dr. Presidio stated that senior staff was excited about pursuing this possibility. Dr. Braybrand confirmed that work could be done without interfering with his senior staff's mission critical work. The school board, however, voted no. No staff time and no funding in the 2022 budget. Once again, the school board is telling Lewis students to wait. Now is not their time. It has not been their time over the past 16 years when harmful and unwanted boundary changes have taken place. It has not been their time when the school board has failed to change the student transfer request regulation that harms enrollment at Lewis. And it has not been their time when resources that are rather ordinary at, and found at most other high schools in Fairfax County are not made available at Lewis High School. During the meeting, school board members used words such as great idea, amazing, it really needs to happen, we super love this idea. And yet some of these same members went on to say, it's not the right time, I cannot support this, I'm missing information. Let's take this really slowly. Six of the members voting no were recently elected to the board and all of them campaigned on a platform promising to promote equity and excellence. Three of these new members again voted no, even after a new timetable was suggested and other veteran board members expressed total confidence that senior staff could handle this development of program. The school board's slow and foot dragging no vote certainly makes one question how members are incorporating equity into all of their decisions. When Sorry, these are, are you, are you these requesting are, something related to the budget regarding this? Yes, I am. The board's super slow decision has made it possible, has not made it possible for this programming to be considered in the budget for 2020. Six long years ago, largely due to the pressure created by the Black Lives Matter movement, the school board finally agreed to change the name of the school. And following that, the momentum from the school was that there would be an opportunity for a program like this to be developed at Lewis High School. And that, of course, was put forth by the students that you heard from earlier. Your no vote has been the only negative voice that we have heard from the Lewis community and from anywhere in the surrounding area of Fairfax County. We certainly expect you to reconsider your budget decision and to continue, we will continue to ask you to reconsider that vote and to change your no vote to a yes vote. And to perhaps do that in a meeting as opposed to a forum where very few people are aware of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. We have speaker 27, Ms. Amanda Campbell. Good evening. I'm speaking tonight as Vice President of Fairfax County Special Education BTA. I have come before this body to speak to the budget multiple times over the last four years, each time focusing on the need for addressing systemic failures concerning how related services such as PT, OT, speech and language, and assistive technology are delivered. 
We have repeatedly asked for more assistive technology staff and resources to address the needs in ATS, for staffing ratios to be determined per workload, not headcount, especially for speech and language services, and for greater training mandated for all members of a student's instructional team in meeting their students' unique needs. These are just the tip of the systemic failures that impact students' ability to access appropriately challenging curriculum with the appropriate supports. There has been no meaningful change in that time. In fact, gaps were getting wider before COVID-19. As of 2018-2019, the reading SOL pass rate for students with disabilities district-wide is just 54%. That's down from 59% in 2016-2017. The percentage of third grade students with disabilities reading on grade level or above is a horrific 46%. The math SOL pass rate district-wide is just 60% for students with disabilities. And this does not include students on the VAP track. I'm unable to find FCPS-specific data for that. Statewide, only 12% of students with intellectual disabilities and 25% of students with multiple disabilities passed their math SOLs in 2018-2019. Only 6% of students with intellectual disabilities and 24% of those with multiple disabilities passed their reading SOLs that year. This is a district that describes itself to the world as, quote, a catalyst that transforms our community's most valuable potential, our children, and shapes a thriving future. Does anyone from the school board or the leadership team think these SOL pass rates for students with disabilities foretell a thriving future? While SCPS's numbers are slightly better than the dismal numbers from the state, they are hardly a catalyst of transformation. You cannot claim to operate from a place of presuming confidence and inclusion and somehow think that these pass rates reflect appropriate curriculum access, services, and support. FCPS parents would be filling up your emails and demanding immediate change if the overall population reading pass rate were 54% or 60% for math. These deficits existed long before COVID-19, are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, and will exist long after COVID-19. We understand that it is a difficult budget year, but FCPS's baseline approach to special education needs a significant overhaul, and our students cannot wait until the audit results or recommendations from the JLARC study are put into place by the General Assembly. We need actual individualized supports, systemic in-person supports for all those who need them, even if a student needs to be virtual otherwise, and lower caseloads for our related service providers based on hours, not headcount, for best practices. Be the leader you claim to be and make the change you know need to be made without having to be told by another institution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Next, we have speaker 28, Ms. Diane Cooper-Gold. Good evening, tireless members of the school board. I'm Diane Cooper-Gold, advocacy chair of Fairfax County SEPTA. The COVID era imposes an even heavier budgeting burden on you than usual. Students and staff needs are compounded by educational loss and mental health challenges. Even the president has mentioned the critical need to address COVID impact on education. Budgeting and planning to address these educational losses must be thoughtful, deliberate, and spend multiple years. Evidence shows that education and life skill losses due to extended learning gaps outside of school profoundly affect students with disabilities to a greater extent than their peers. Without a doubt, special education students are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 school closures. And yet the plan for special education recovery services is extremely vague. It has no firm guidelines to encourage equity and is currently only designed to address uncovered loss, unrecovered losses between March and June of 2019, despite the reality of ongoing student losses over an entire year of truncated learning services. How are we as a county planning for the long-term multi-year effort it will take to catch up all of our students? And where is the comprehensive plan to target those hardest hit? One of the biggest blocks holding back FCPS is the failure to adequately plan for, implement, analyze, and most importantly, sustain new initiatives over time. It is critical that FCPS have clear project management plans. These plans must be deliberate and specific. They must cover short-term, medium-term, and multi-year plan implementation, budgeting, and monitoring. FCPS must budget for ongoing labor and resources, not just initial rollouts. In particular, SEPTA is extremely concerned about the lack of a specific plan and budget for the enactment of the new restraint and seclusion policy. Restraint and seclusion policy is meaningless if not implemented with fidelity and staff are not solidly trained in new and effective strategies to address student needs. 
The deadline is practically around the corner, and yet despite our repeated inquiries, there is zero evidence of an effective plan being designed to implement this policy safely and to make a positive transition. Further, intensive training and resources are needed immediately in all programs where seclusion and restraint were practiced but no longer will be, and at the three locations where seclusion will still be used for the interim. It is our responsibility of FCPS to formulate comprehensive plans for implementing policy. It is up to the school board to manage FCPS and to ensure that FCPS delivers on its promises. It is critical that the budget take into account the full multi-year implications of restraint and seclusion policy and all new policies, or those policies will not be effective, children and staff will be traumatized, and this will be a failure on the part of FCPS and the school board. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Cooper Gold. Next, we have Michelle Hadis. Speaker 29. I'm getting there, sorry. That's okay, just wanted to check that we are up to Speaker 29. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Michelle Cades, President of Fairfax County SEPTA. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight and for your support of special education. 2,865, remember that number. We need as much funding as possible to provide additional staffing in schools to support all students, particularly for mental health needs. Between compensatory and COVID recovery services, many special education students will need additional services due to regression or poor progress on their IEP goals. There are no slated increases for staffing related service providers like OTs, PTs, and speech language pathologists. Historically and frankly, FCPS has been horrible at providing robust reading instruction using the science of reading and evidence-based multi-sensory methodologies like Orton-Gillingham, an approach developed over 80 years ago and still the best practice for teaching students to read. One central office reading specialist was hired only three years ago. She subsequently became OG certified and has since trained a small percentage of special educators in OG. After this year, the demand and need for this type of instruction will be even more staggering than it already was pre-COVID. A year ago, FCPS proudly touted that close to a dozen social workers were being added to the central office staff to send support where it was most needed throughout the county. But support is needed everywhere. Direct services in schools now. So returning to 2,865, it's the number of students at my kids' high school. Our 11 school counselors oversee some 260 students apiece, writing their individualized college recommendations, supporting their overwhelming mental health needs, plus coordinating 132 students' 504 plans. Supplemental funding comes with special ed IEPs, not with 504 plans. So some high schools actually outsource 504 plan management by reducing teaching periods for special educators so they can relieve the school counselors. Meanwhile, our 1.5 psychologists cover 1,900 students each, and the social worker. She covers all 2,865 students, students who need social histories written as part of the IEP process, students with school phobia, hunger, housing and clothing insecurity, substance use, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, abuse, neglected, and even sex trafficked. Yes, there is sex trafficking at our high school. 2,865 students, one social worker. That is disgraceful. There is a dire need for additional social work staff in our schools. I implore you, please increase funding for special education, for related services, and for mental health staffing directly in our schools. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Cades. Um, we have speaker 30, Ms. Lindsay Delizio. Hi, my name is Lucy Grego, and I'm actually speaking on in Ms. Galizio's place. Um, I'm sorry, can you just state your name again, please? We miss it. Um, Melissa Grego. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Grego. Thank you. <laughs> my name is Melissa Grego, and I'm a high school history teacher in FCPS and a member of FCFT. I have worked in FCPS and lived in Virginia for three years. Prior to moving to Virginia, I taught in Colorado for many years. While I loved working with my students in my classes, my family greatly struggled due to the lack of teacher pay and cost of living. It took my husband and I three jobs to support ourselves and our two children due to the extremely low teacher pay. 
Most of my years spent in Colorado were spent working in districts who froze teacher pay and steps without any consideration of the staff those freezes affected. However, for the first time since I went into education, Colorado found funding within the CARES Act to give their teachers a raise to cover the COLA and benefits increases along with an additional percentage in pay and step to show their appreciation for what their teachers had done during this pandemic. Steps for experience are important to an educator. Steps acknowledge our years of experience in our respected fields of education. Steps do not necessarily correlate with pay. However, every year we remain frozen on a step. Student, uh, sorry, teachers lose out on the acknowledgement of our earned years of experience. If the district is insistent on freezing pay due to lack of funding, please at least consider allowing our steps for the past two years of experience that have been frozen and adjusting the salary scale to honor our steps and reflect the pay freeze. This also negatively impacts your staff who are close to retirement, along with impacting your first year teachers who are now stuck at a first year teacher's pay in that year of experience. Your staff has worked tirelessly this school year to ensure our students are receiving the best education we can possibly provide regardless of this pandemic and this unprecedented school year. We have sacrificed weekends, sleep, time with our own families and children to make sure that our students are receiving the best education possible. We are being asked to adapt and once again learn a new way of teaching our students with the concurrent model when we return to our buildings. This model will cause most teachers an even heavier workload. But we are teachers and we will do what's best for our kids because we love them. We now are being told vaccines are not available and face the possibility of coming in without being vaccinated. Many of your staff are feeling undervalued and expendable. Please consider approving our steps to show as a show of good faith for all the hard work we are doing for our students and for FCPS. I appreciate your willingness to hear these concerns tonight and I appreciate the board and Dr. Braban for all you've done for keeping health and safety in mind when making decisions about our return to school and about our budget. Thank you and have a wonderful night. Thank you, Ms. Grego. I just want to confirm, um, Ms. Lindsay Galizio, we had you as speaker 30 and we did have Ms. Melissa Grego as 31. She just spoke, are, are you going to speak now too? Um, she's not here. I never received a link, so she gave me her link because she hasn't been feeling well tonight. <laughs> okay. All right. I understand. So Lindsay um, Galizia will not be speaking this evening. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Yes, thank you. Good night. Um, we have speaker number 32, Ms. Lauren McKay. Good evening. What's the point of the education budget? The ultimate goal should be to educate students so that they are ready to meet their goals as adults. On paper, FCPS does that well, using some of the best resources available in the country, including the TUI handbook and the transition toolkit. Central office staff consistently put out fantastic materials for schools. Unfortunately, those tools are rarely used. I have a budget request to fix that. Two years ago, I attended a wonderful transition workshop put on for parents. When the panel asked the audience if they had received from their IEP teams the FCPS Transition Toolkit as mandated, two of approximately 40 parents raised their hands. The central office staff were visibly surprised and made a note to look into this further. Daily realities in our schools should not surprise or horrify central office staff. Many students with IEPs are leaving school totally unprepared for the real world. Many IEPs are being written with NFL player or YouTuber as career plans for students with no viable way to get there. No career plan should be chosen without specific information on the forms about how the school is directly supporting that goal. If the school doesn't have that student on its football team, NFL player can't be put as the primary career goal. If the school isn't providing video editing classes to the student, YouTuber must be replaced by something within the school's programming. Every student should have a realistic career goal with details about classes helping the student prepare for it. There are huge disparities from school to school. I'm so tired of hearing that should never happen from central office staff about realities in our schools. I'm tired of seeing central office staff be surprised that the wonderful resources they've developed have never been used. We need to bridge the gap between what happens to students on paper and what happens to them in real life. Staff who attend 40 different IEP meetings in 40 different schools annually will know what really happens. I suggest that all central office staff be required to spend one full day weekly, 20% of their time in the field. 
each of these days, they'd attend at least one IEP meeting for a student in their area of expertise, observe classes, and speak with teachers, students, and parents about concerns. Funding this program would force central office staff and school staff to directly confront the different realities they currently inhabit. No communication strategy is as effective as being in the same rooms weekly, whether virtually or in person. Requiring central office staff to be in different schools weekly will improve communication, raise awareness of existing resources, and lessen gaps. A very small budget for this could create a huge change in culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have speaker 33, uh, Denise Marcone. Or Marcone. That's Marconi, that's fine. Hello, school board members, school staff, Dr. Bray Ben. My name is Denise Marconi. I'm a school social worker at Eagle View Elementary and I've been with Fairfax County for the past nine years. I'm speaking to you tonight on behalf of the budget, line item, where school psychologists and school counselors are added, but social workers are not. Given our roles in the school, especially during a pandemic, this is frustrating and we feel will not be helpful to our students or families. So I started to wonder, is this oversight in the budget because folks just don't understand what we do in the schools and don't understand our training? We provide a wide range of services in schools, but tonight I wanna to highlight our clinical skills and how we use them in the schools. In addition to our master's level education, which included many classes in therapeutic interventions, two thirds of our school social workers in FCPS are licensed clinical social workers. That means that we spent two to three years of additional training followed by a state exam. With this license, we're able to work outside the schools diagnosing and providing therapy to clients. There are more school social workers in the school than any other staff who have this qualification, training, and ability to provide those clinical support. Something unique to social workers is that we take a systems approach when working with students, which means we look at the whole student. We don't just look at them as a diagnosis or an academic number. We are the only staff in the school that can coordinate, plan, and execute the Children's Service Funding Act for our families. What this means is we use our clinical skills to meet with parents, assess their situation, and then formulate a plan of action for mental health services. We then case manage these cases, which involves regular meetings with families and outside agencies who are providing the services. Services include home-based counseling, ABA therapy, respite care, mentoring, and so much more. In fact, last year, school social workers brought in over $6 million of services to FCPS families. A few of our social workers manage over 10 cases, which is considered a full-time job at the Community Services Board. Principals find social workers so valuable that many of them are using their discretionary funds to pay for their social workers so they can have them in their building full-time. I wanna to add too that we are the ones helping families with their basic needs. As Maslow's hierarchy of needs illustrates, students and families whose basic needs are not being met will struggle to achieve in school and reach their potential. Academic success can't even be addressed with families until we have done met their basic needs. Social workers are the ones that, who are working directly with the families to help them with these needs. And here again, we're using our clinical skills to make families feel comfortable, cared for, and understood. As I've read through the portrait of graduate and looked at the characteristics and traits that we want for our students, we as the social workers in FCPS work daily with our students and families to help them achieve these skills. With the continually growing needs of our families and the mental health concerns those are creating, we cannot afford to have fewer number of social workers in the building. Social workers are the staff are largely dealing with these needs. I'm asking you to approve a budget for 2022 that splits the 10 school psychology positions with school social workers five and five. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Marconi. Speaker 30 is Emily Vanderhoff. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Emily Vanderhoff. I'm a first grade teacher at Hunt Valley Elementary School and an executive board member of FCFT. I'm here today to urge you to work with the Board of Supervisors to provide a step increase for staff in the FY22 budget. The step freezes we experienced during the last recession have caused a permanent salary scale compression that continues to this day and will continue to follow affected staff through their retirement. When steps are frozen, it does not just affect staff for that one year. Their salaries are set back a year permanently and they progress to the scale a level below where they would have been without the freeze. As retirement compensation is also tied to an employee's highest three or five years of salary, 
The ramifications extend even beyond an employee's time in FCPS. Steps were frozen for four consecutive years, starting in the 2009-2010 school year. The step freeze in the FY22 budget will represent the sixth step lost by staff who have been with FCPS since before 2009. Looking at the FY21 salary scales and assuming it will look the same as the frozen FY22 scale, a staff member with 15 years of experience in the 2021-22 school year would be at step nine with six freezes that they've experienced over their career. A new staff member transferring into the county with 15 years of experience would start at step 14. With the same experience and assuming both are teachers in the BA, BA lands, the employees who work for FCPS through all the freezes would face a penalty of $6,852 that year in their salary for their loyalty to FCPS. The original FCPS staff member would also continue to make that much less than their peer each year for the rest of their careers. The new freezes also compound um, the issues starting in the last recession and are also adding new teachers to this pattern of undercompensation. One of my teammates is a second year teacher. So this year she's on the same step as the first year teachers. Next year as a third year teacher, she'll be on the same step that the new group of first year teachers will start on. These three years of new teachers will continue to progress at the same pace for the remainder of their careers, despite a three year difference in their level of experience. If we, even if we can't afford a market scale adjustment due to the economic realities of the pandemic, we have to find a way to offer some compensation to account for another year of increased experience and continued loyalty to the district. Not doing so has dire implications for retention of staff. Staff are watching as nearby districts, including Prince William and Loudoun counties, plan to fund a step increase for their staff. The longer FCPS goes without a step increase, the more likely we are to lose staff to these neighboring counties. FCPS invests a significant amount of funding in staff development, training, and mentorship. We stand to lose this investment and institutional knowledge as more more and more experienced staff choose to leave for other districts where their years of experience would place them at a higher step. Pre-service teachers are also looking for a district that values staff not only in words, but in action. Um, demonstrating value for experience will go along in keeping attracting, retaining a premier workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Van Vanderhoff. Speaker number 35, Ms. Jean-Marie Nagel. Hello, my name is Jean Marie Nagel and I'm sort of mortified by what Emily just said. I've lost $6,852 in compensation over the past several years because I have been with the county for 15 years. And that's an aside. This year has been immeasurably difficult for everyone. We are very happy to still have our jobs, but like so many others, our jobs look nothing like they looked at the beginning of the last school year. We've worked through difficulties, learned more about technology than we ever would have imagined, spent as much time on teaching this year as we did in our first year of teaching, which I can't even imagine that. And you have asked, and we have delivered. We have taken trainings formally and researched how to do things on our own. Teachers have purchased extra monitors, furniture, clothing, PPE, so we can they can change before getting back to their families. Please use money from the CARES Act to show your appreciation. Unfortunately for most of us, our net pay has de decreased to increasing healthy health care costs, new and unforeseen family obligations, and adjusting to living in a way that is safe during the pandemic. Many of us no longer have the extra jobs we had to help make ends meet. Even if they were available, our teaching and preparation schedule would make it an impossibility to take on another job. We need an increase in pay just to stay even. Please use money from the Care Act, CARES Act to show your appreciation. We've been working hard throughout the entire ordeal and it should be rewarded. An increase in pay is an appropriate way to show gratitude for our hard work. It has been promised in the past, but not delivered. Please use money from the CARES Act to show your appreciation. We all wanna get back and teach kids in person. There are a few groups who have signed up to get the vaccine as quickly as, and there are a few groups who have signed up to get the vaccine as quickly and completely as our teachers and staff. Dr. Brabrand said 90% of us signed up basically as soon as the system could handle all of us. This shows a dedication to our job. Please use the money from the CARES Act to show your appreciation. Yesterday, many of the appointments were canceled. Two things about that. The adjustment to concurrent take, teaching will take time and an enormous amount of energy and creat creativity from teachers who under the current budget 
iteration, we'll be doing a lot more without an increase in pay. And students and teachers should not be back in the building until at very least teachers who choose to be vaccinated have their immunity. This would be another way for you to choose, choose to show your appreciation for your teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nagel. Speaker 36, Ms. Sarah Berry. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak with you tonight about what I should believe should have priority and be funded in the 2022 budget. I reviewed many documents leading up to this meeting. One presentation highlighted the school board's priority. And on this page, and a few pages after that, I see lists of 30 plus items, and none are five day in person school weeks for kids, a quality virtual school option nor a priority to fill in the learning gap that even Dr. Braybrand states will take years. On top of that, I see that this year's teachers' salaries are frozen and in jeopardy for 2022. I am here today to ask that you refocus all efforts and 2022 budget on blocking and tackling and getting our schools back to solid foundations of teaching and learning. You need to deprioritize de those items that are not specifically laddering up to these activities. As I stated just a moment ago, priority number one, five days in person. With no assurance that this is gonna happen in the fall, this falls into 2022 and it's not in the budget. It's just as it sounds, no less. Every day that our children are not in the classroom is additional harm to their well being well-being of today and well-being of the future. There are solutions for our buildings to be safe envir environments, and it is time to prioritize our children to be in school five days a week. We need to see specific budget to support this effort. We need to have transparency into the CARES Act funding and spending. We need to have a budget that supports students in school five days a week. Priority number two, for those students that need to be home, we need to have a more robust virtual option. As it is today, I think we can all say that in, for many, if not most, the FCPS virtual solution is not ideal. Many teachers I talk to agree, the solution is not as effective as it needs to be. And when I talk to students, they say that while they're busy, they are not engaging and they are not learning. Consider just the ability to engage with a face. Our kids don't do that. I have four children in FCPS and not one turns on their video, including the elementary student. I can't just, I just can't understand not finding a solution for backgrounds, bandwidth and earbuds. I don't know why we're not in a situation where we find a problem and we find a solution. Instead, FCPS has said it's okay to leave them off. I know this is just one example. There are lots of options, solutions and approaches that need to be considered. And FCPS needs to make this a priority and it needs to be in the budget for a better virtual solution. Priority number three, FCPS students are stuck in a learning deficit. Well, this, I'll make it quick. We need to be able to help the high school kids out. They move on from one class to the next and the next teacher does not go back and sure up what they lost prior. The priority four is that teachers need to be paid appropriately they are a priority and we need to have budget for them. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Barry. Barry, appreciate okay. your comments Thank tonight. You. Our next speaker, Our next speaker 37, Ms. Sarah Robles. Good evening, school board members. This is the second year teachers and staff are being asked to go without step increases or cost of living adjustments to our salaries. You have repeatedly said teachers have gone above and beyond this year. While that is nice to hear, it does not help us pay our bills. Many of us have spent out of pocket for additional technology and PPE. Now, I'm not expecting a huge raise, as I know our budget is strained from the pandemic. However, I was expecting to get my yearly step increase as well as my cost of living adjustment. What I find particularly interesting is that the superintendent received a salary increase in his new extended contract. 
If we did not have the budget to compensate teachers for the step increases, how did we have the money to give Dr. Braybrand a raise? The new extended contract, which is publicly available on board docs, states a base salary of $311,526 with an annual adjustment for step increases and cost of living. The previous contract made in 2017 was for $290,000 uh, again with allowances for annual adjustments for step increases and cost of living. If teachers and staff do not get cost of living adjustments, why does our superintendent? Furthermore, FCPS is essentially giving teachers a pay cut when our insurance premiums increase while our salaries remain stagnant for two years. This does not seem in line with our caring culture. If FCPS staff are essential and have, gov and have gone above and beyond, please show us by compensating us appropriately. Also, please delay in-person learning until staff can be fully vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robles. Speaker 38, Danielle Armstrong. Thank you. Dr. Braban and school board members, my name is Danielle Armstrong and I'm a FCPS school social worker and also the president of the Fairfax Association of School Social Workers. I am here today to ask for equal positions with our school psychology colleagues in the FY22 budget, five and five. The current proposed FY22 budget with the addition of 10 psychologists and no additional social workers leaves social work with eight fewer positions and a higher staffing ratio. This is a significant concern of parity. I want to spend a few minutes discussing the possibly lesser known roles of FCPS social workers. We are in every school building, but we are also a part of early childhood assessment teams and serve at the homeless liaison's office. As part of child find, school social workers connect students with early intervention services that help prepare them for success in kindergarten, as well as warmly guide parents during a very stressful period of time. We uphold the McKinney-Vento Act, arranging transportation and providing continuity of education for our homeless students and ensure the most stability possible for our students in the foster care system. School social workers explicitly support the FCPS strategic plan, specifically student success and caring culture. We are an integral part in providing evidence-based attendance interventions to support on-time graduation benchmarks. School social workers coordinate Check and Connect mentors and implement attendance interventions for students not receiving Check and Connect as an intervention. Sometimes this support looks like daily text messages to encourage students to attend class, a task that has become harder in a virtual world. Additionally, they are integral members of attendance team and buildings, as well as serving as FCPS attendance specialists. The COVID-19 pandemic has been traumatic for many of our students. Our training gives us a lens for how this traumatic event coincides with other adversities experienced by our families. FCPS school social workers are leaders in the trauma-informed care network and offer Trauma 101 in building a trauma-informed classroom, professional development opportunities to teachers and support staff across the county. We believe that staffing of social workers is an equity and ethics issue. As social workers serve the FCPS families most at risk, we advocate for equity and anti-racist policies. We speak up because we have a professional ethical obligation, but also because our colleagues, students, and families of color deserve to feel safe, supported, and seen. We have an obligation to educate the next generation of anti-racist citizens. Please join us in prioritizing the needs of the most vulnerable members of our school community by honoring our profession with parity to school psychologists. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Armstrong. And we have our last registered speaker, Speaker 39, Nona Bowers. Good evening. My name is Nona Bowers and I am an FCPS school social worker. I am speaking today to advocate on behalf of school social workers for our positions in the upcoming budget. I'm also speaking today as a representative of the FASSW, the Fairfax Association of School Social Workers and the Equity Workgroup to advocate for equity throughout FCPS. I wanna share with you what a day in the life of a school social worker might look like on any given day. 8 a.m., read email and plan for the day. 8.30, 
attend the attendance MTSS team meeting to review data with the team and brainstorm interventions, discuss progress on previous interventions and identify next steps for the team and each case. 9 a.m., call a parent who has concerns about their child's mental health. Ask the parent to share concerns, listen, reflect, and give suggestions, including community resources if needed, behavioral strategies, and parenting tools. 9.30 a.m., see a student with counseling on their IEP, provide interventions to support student engagement while addressing IEP needs and goals. 10 a.m., provide consultation to a teacher about a student behavior concern. Encourage the teacher to reflect on their own power and privilege and ways they can respond with restorative practices. 1045, provide social emotional learning lesson to a classroom of first grade students using Komochi curriculum. This curriculum is designed to teach young children about their feelings and the social skills they need for friendships. 1130, attend a reevaluation meeting. Participate in the team's considerations of whether updated evaluations are needed or appropriate. 1230, sociocultural interview with a parent. Meet with a parent whose child's being considered for special ed eligibility. Help the parent feel comfortable and safe sharing about their lives. Gather the data needed about the child's history, needs, strengths, and parents' concerns. Use my social work lens of, an anti of anti-oppression to fully see the parent, fully hear them, and fully value them. Two o'clock, check email, return phone calls. Three o'clock, plan next week's counseling sessions and groups, four o'clock, document today's efforts and respond to emails, 4.30, log off. As social workers, we are helpers. We are thinkers, we are listeners, we are problem solvers, we are confidants, we are crisis responders, we are advocates. We are advocating for equal positions with our school psychology partners, five and five, for the fiscal year 22 budget. Also, as advocates and members of the FASSW Equity Workgroup, we voted to adopt the National Black Lives Matter at School Initiative and Principles. We will participate in this initiative during the week of February 1st through the 5th because Black Lives Matter and it's time to stand up for what is right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe that concludes all of our registered speakers. Um, Ms. Mulberg, have any of the registered speakers who we skipped earlier because they weren't present uh, shown up? Your no, I don't believe they have. No. Okay. And is there anyone else um, left to speak that perhaps didn't register, or is that the no? That was the final speaker. Okay. Well, wonderful. Well, this was quite an informative evening um, on an array of topics, and the next steps in the budget development process is going to be uh, in just about 12 hours or so, a little bit more than that, on um, Wednesday, January 27th, tomorrow, our school board will be having a public work session about the budget development and the superintendent's proposed budget. That begins at 11 a.m. and is scheduled to go until 2. Um, so please check in on that and more information about the budget is of course on our website. February 18th is when our school board will be voting on the advertised budget that will then go over to our Fairfax County Board of Supervisors for their consideration. So thank you very much everyone and good night.